welcome to the First Methodist online worship service. Today's service is performed by Pastor Aaron Ackney. Now here is today's service.
and the hateful doctrine. O God of, dark, God of darkness and dawn, shine into our lives this very hour. Awake in us, your glory, reveal your truth and grace. Reclaim our hope as morning reclaims the light of day. As long as we were no people, now we have become your people. Illumine for us the power of your word. And show us the challenge of your will. Allow us to reflect you into the world. And mark us as people of the new world you know have promised. Accept now our worship as we offer it to you. And, and may our love be pleasing to your heart. And if you will turn next to number 111, how can we name a love and although the words may not be familiar to you, I think probably you will do fine and recognize the tune as a very frequent, frequently sung tune. <laughs> affirmations of faith 
sometimes old historic ones and sometimes ones that fit the theme for the day. This morning happens to be an, an affirmation profession of faith that fits the day. I invite you to turn to your bulletin. I am going to turn this around today. I'm going to read the bold and you read the other response, if you would. We are the people of God. We are the Son of the world to come. We are followers of Christ, children of God, and citizens of heaven. We believe in the Creator God. We believe in the God. We believe God is the perfect Father. We believe God left glory and entered into human history in Jesus Christ.
But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, denari, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which, e which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. We have offering plates at the front and the back of the sanctuary, and we would ask you to bow and pray together this morning for the blessings that we have been given from you, O oh Lord. We are grateful for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord, thank you. And Lord, help us to please be able to bestow blessings about, upon those about us and around us, that they too might feel blessed and loved by your Spirit. Amen.
invitation to each of you as we begin the Lenten season this Wednesday on Valentine's Day, which would be Ash Wednesday. We're celebrating that together with the Wesley Memorial Global Methodist Church. Since we both joined that new denomination, we just want to share things that we have in common together and to begin to maybe interact with each other in a new way since we're part of a new denomination. And so we've planned a, a couple different worship experiences together, this being the first one. So I just invite you to, to be there to start Lent and to have that combined worship experience over at the, at the church building at Wesley Memorial this Wednesday, 6.30. You join with me in our traditional prayer, please. Lord, as we come to this moment now in our worship today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us and our lives would be changed. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So tradition titles our scripture story this morning that Anne read for us as the Good Samaritan. It's only found in the Gospel of Luke, although Luke never actually calls the Samaritan good. The context of the story is simple. Jesus is giving an answer to a question about how one might gain eternal life. Jesus says to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then there was the follow-up question, well, who is my neighbor? And to that, Jesus gave this story, told this story, and offered three examples of neighboring. The first neighboring example is that of the robbers, an example of poor neighboring. We might name their attitude like this. What's yours is mine if I can get it. What's yours is mine if I can get it. And it would be symbolized by grabbing. Grabbing, by and large, gets people in trouble. Amen? This attitude is all about self. Selfish desires. What I want. What's yours is mine, if I can get it. It includes power and possessions and position. We see this manifested all around us in everyday life in things like stealing and robbing, embezzling, Ponzi screen schemes, shoplifting, raping, adultery, identity theft, scams, cons, lying, deception, conniving, abuse. You can see there's a lot of this going on. While some of the methods that we use in this day and age are a little more modern, the intent is absolutely nothing new. It's about taking what's not yours. The Old Testament writers and the prophets warned against this repeatedly. Leviticus 19, for example, part of the holiness code. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest effort and an honest pen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Joshua, chapter 7, 
Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. And then Hosea 7. The sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria are revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. Grabbing violates others. And it goes against God's will and way. And as such, it separates us from God. Today, we can recognize that not all grabbing is illegal. For example, when we recognize excessive charges in business and the professional world, today, disguised as markup, coming close to what we know to be illegal as gouging prices. For example, when you go to Disney, sometimes people call Mickey the rat and not the mouse. Or again, when you go to a stadium at a ball game and you look for hot dogs and drinks, or when you go to a dealership and realize the price is overpriced for work being done there. These are practices that happen that we're not unfamiliar with today that are not illegal, but they borderline grabbing. How about frivolous litigations? History might call our era right now the age of litigation. What is the intent behind all these frivolous lawsuits? If it's not, what's yours is mine if I can get it. And the consequences of this attitude. This has drastically affected the way we live. All of the alerts, amber and red and orange and blue, crazy warning buzzers and bells, locked doors, gated communities, expensive security systems, having to sign children in and out. I can remember even signing our children in and out of Sunday school at a church we went to. Dogs inside homes that should never be inside houses. People going to hospitals and rehabilitation centers, nursing homes, more concerned about what might get grabbed than they are about how am I going to get better. In short, it's caused us to become paranoid. And we live trapped in fear because of grabbing. It's equally true in our cyber world. When we're on the internet and have to be so careful about identity theft and credit card theft. And to be sure, this is not just limited to our society or to our nation. I would suggest to you that the source of most international conflict comes from this very attitude. What's yours is mine, if I can get it. Right now, think about Russia and the Ukraine. Or think about Israel and the Hamas. I'm telling you, this attitude is the root of <coughs> even things like oppression. And perhaps the most subtle form of this attitude comes in our interpersonal relationships. 
What is the motivation for our friendships? For too many people, it's so that there's a personal association where we might gain something from that relationship. Being in a friendship to take advantage of what that person might be able to do for you or offer to you. It's a type of grabbing. Grabbers are poor neighbors. So then we move on to the neighboring example number two that Jesus gave, which is illustrated in the priest and the Levite. These also are bad neighbors. You might describe their attitude like this. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. It's symbolized by clutching or holding tightly, clinging or gripping or saving, or hoarding, or hiding away, or stockpiling. It's manifested today by all of the protective behaviors of personal identification numbers, and codes, and locks, and bolts, and chains, and safes, and alarms. This attitude is still about self. It's about me. It's about my stuff. Think about the little child who, who grabs something and says, no, mine. It's about what I have. It's about preservation of my kingdom. And this attitude is exasperated by grabbers. So you can see that the first two examples are connected. We know of the legislation today allowing deadly force of intruders on our private property. Well, ultimately, the attitude behind that force is the idea of protecting what is mine. What's mine is mine. I'm going to keep it. Security clearly is one of our social obsessions today. Feeling safe and secure is one of our top priorities in our human nature. That's one of the reasons why firearm possession has skyrocketed in the last number of years, because people do not feel safe anymore. And TV news is a huge contributor to this mania that is being the, is growing in this country. Constantly and purposely, the media brings fear into our homes by highlighting stories about grabbers with bylines like, could this happen to you? That feeds the mania and the frenzy. Now, many people hold to what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. That's why we have all of the security systems that we have. That's why we have gated communities. That's why cameras are everywhere right now. And let's face it, what's the largest line item in our national budget? Ultimately, it's security. And look what this is doing to our children. Look how we indoctrinate our young people now because of this. Don't talk to strangers. No, you can't go outside. I can't go out and be with you right now. Mind your own business. Stay out of other matters. That doesn't apply to you. Don't make that your problem. Reporting homeless people as suspicious looking and possibly dangerous. See, all of these things reflect this attitude of what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. The preservation of my kingdom. What's behind this? 
Well, ultimately, it's that human nature with greed. That's the driving emotion behind this attitude. The fear of losing anything that is mine. The Bible tells us that the spirit of fear is always opposed to God because God's perfect love casts out fear. So living in greed and fear, we make our own prisons. This attitude is outside of God's plan for living. And so it's another attitude that separates us from God. What's mine is mine. I mean, let's just think about that for a moment. How does something become mine? When does something become mine? Let's ask another question. What in this world does not belong to God? What right do I have to claim anything in this world? I mean, if I believe, and I do, that God made everything, and the maker has full ownership rights, How do I own anything? And don't forget this. Fortunately for all of us, the idea of what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it is not how God treats you and me. Amen? Nor is it what God teaches for us in the Holy Scriptures. Jesus addressed this attitude in another story about a man who realized a new supply of surplus crops. And he said, I'll tear down my old barns and I'll build newer, bigger barns so that I can store my new treasures. Yeah, what's mine is mine. I'm going to keep it. Grabbing and clutching neighbors depart from God's purpose of self-sacrificing love and sharing. Self-elevation and self-preservation leave no room to love God supremely and to love others as ourselves. So that brings us to the third example of neighboring in the story that Jesus told. And this is represented by the Samaritan person, a godly neighbor or a good neighbor. And we might summarize this attitude by saying, what's mine is yours, here, take some. It's symbolized by handing. Instead of an attitude that is me-centered, this practices self-sacrifice. It's interesting in this story that Jesus chose a Samaritan to be this godly, good neighbor. I mean, Jews were unabashedly prejudiced against Samaritans. Here in the South, it might be like glorifying one of them Yankees. Or maybe even a little more pointedly, in this country, it would be like lifting up one of those radical Muslims or someone from the Chinese Communist Party. 
The word in scripture that describes the Samaritan's compassion literally means from the gut. We say things like, well, I, I had this gut feeling. That's what it's talking about. It's the same word that's used for the compassion that the prodigal son, the, the father had for the prodigal son. That kind of compassion comes from deep inside the gut or the soul. That's the type of love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13. This compassion is what results in active caring for any and all who at some given moment cannot handle their own life. This type of compassion also goes against all the things we teach and what we have learned about evolution and the survival of the fittest. It's on the other end of the spectrum. This kind of compassion is self-sacrificing immersion into someone else's circumstances. It moves us beyond our own comfort zone and makes us vulnerable. It means we give up some of what we have because another person needs it more than we do right now. It recognizes that there are really no barriers to our giving. And in our Bible study on Wednesday mornings, we're learning that James equates this type of work as a demonstration of real faith. Fleshing out this type of compassion is how we truly show we love God. Without this compassionate love, the world will never be a better place. Let me say that again, because this is the heart of what the church is supposed to bring to the world. Without this compassionate love, the world will never be a better place. Without self-sacrificing, the only alternative for people in need is to take what they need. Without handing, grabbing is the only option left. Hope for peace on earth rests in people who will be willing to say, what's mine is yours, here, take some. Practicing generous giving from self-sacrificing love. Church, it's this simple. Nothing will change peaceably without this love. The kingdom of God came to earth precisely because of this type of love. Which mine is yours. Here, take it. During his tenure of presidency, George Bush Jr. met with the faith-based leaders and he spoke these words. Notice how they address this neighborly compassion. You know, one of the tests of character for America is how we treat the weakest of our citizens. Interesting test, isn't it? What are we doing in government to help people who need help? 
Part of the test of government is to understand the limitations of government. Government, when I think about government, I think about law and justice. I really don't think about love. Government, therefore, has got to find ways to empower those whose mission is based upon love in order to help those who need love find love in our society. That's really what we are here to talk about this morning. What an amazing understanding and application of this scriptural truth that we're learning today. Especially coming from a government leader. I'm going to wrap this up now. Identifying the second purpose for this story. The first purpose was Christ redefining the concept of what a loving neighbor is. The second purpose of this story is just as important, but it's very different. In this story, Jesus is talking about himself. We need to compare the good Samaritan to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good Samaritan neighbor from heaven. Now remember and note how many of the Jews were prejudiced against Jesus. It was prophesied so. Isaiah predicted that he would be despised and forsaken and rejected by men. And yet, he sacrificed the glory of the heavenly realm to come and live restricted in a physical body, experiencing the human hassle, hurt, and harassment, and even ultimately hanging on a cross until he was dead. Paying the price for us to be healed and made whole. Again, just as the prophet Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. Everyone who is breathing knows firsthand how cruel life can be. At some time, in one form or another, we all have been beaten, robbed, and left dead in life. Whether we're pummeled by an illness or a fear or worry or injustice or cruelty or grief or abuse, we've been stripped of joy and peace and dignity and hope and left wounded and dying along the road of life. Who will help us? Who can help us? Which is another sermon we won't get into today. Who can save us? Only God. Through Christ. The one who is greatly derided in our society today is the only one who can save us. Christ literally helped people when he was here in person, in body, when he was living and breathing on earth. Now, Christ helps people through his body, the church, you and me, alive in the world today. 
And it's noteworthy that the same word in Scripture for salvation is the word for healing. Healing and salvation are the same thing. Church, that's seriously good news. God sent Christ and he said, here, what's mine is yours. Take it. Two things need to happen. In each soul, right now, this morning. First, we each need to be healed, saved. Everyone here, no exceptions. Where are you hurting? What are you struggling with? Maybe even secretly. What is robbing you of joy or peace? You can be saved by Christ this morning. What's mine is yours. Here, take it. Be healed. The second thing that needs to happen here is that we, each one of us in here, need to become a good neighbor, a self-sacrificing neighbor. Being a good neighbor has nothing to do with State Farm, all due respect. We must learn to love God and in that, to love others as ourselves. So that we can be the hands and the feet and the tongues of the body of Christ, showing compassion to the world. Here, what's mine is yours. Take it. Heavenly Father, may that be so today and indeed may the world be changed in your son we pray. Amen. We stand for our final song.
Holy Spirit, comfort. Life challenges. God makes all things possible. Life disappears. God offers eternity. Life hurts. Christ heals. Life is full of turmoil. The Holy Spirit fills us with peace. Depart in mission. We go as Christ's ambassadors. God bless you until we meet again. First Methodist Church is located at 973 South Marion Avenue, Lake City, Florida, 32056. For more information about our church, call 386-752-4488 or visit our website at www.lcfumc.org.